Hello, my name is Jasmine Eatman. I am a fourth year in the MD-PhD program uh, here at Emory, and I am happy to share with you today um, the project entitled Ensuring Equitable COVID-19 Vaccine Access via Mobile Vaccine Clinics at Predominantly Black Churches in Atlanta, Georgia. We know that racial and ethnic groups that are minoritized have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We also know that structural racism and historical abuses have served as barriers to early uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine in these groups. So in order to address this issue, medical student groups, in addition to community partners, implemented an initiative to address concerns about vaccination and facilitate vaccine uptake for for predominantly Black faith-based congregations in Atlanta. We did this by recruiting 26 medical student volunteers. These volunteers participated in 12 weekly mobile vaccine clinics through predominantly Black churches. Fulton County Board of Health provided training on vaccine administration while supervision was provided by medical doctor members of the Emory African American Women's Collaborative. As a result of this initiative, 780 community members were vaccinated. On average, medical student volunteers vaccinated approximately 65 people per day. The highest single day vaccination rate was 126 individuals. You can see in figure one of the results section that the grand majority of racial and ethnic um, groups of my medical student volunteers were Black and African American at 19 volunteers. This was an intentional effort. We wanted um, community members who were being vaccinated to feel comfortable with the um, vac people who were vaccinating them. And we also wanted to leverage um, the ability to build rapport among um, racial and ethnic um, groups that uh, mirrored the population. We, uh, as you can see in figure two, the highest single day vaccination rate was on April 15th, 2021 at 126 community members. In summary, Cultural congruence lever was leveraged to build trust, provide education, and address fears in the community about the COVID-19 vaccine. We addressed structural barriers by providing free direct access to the vaccine at a trusted establishment, which was the predominantly Black church. We um, aspire to have future initiatives that include establishing partnerships between community organizers, public health entities, and academic institutions, which will continue to provide education on vaccine importance and safety. We'd like to acknowledge um, the Fulton County Board of Health, who was instrumental in allowing us to um, reach the community in this way. We also would like to acknowledge the Emory African American Women's Collaborative and Dr. Xanthia Wiley, who provided incredible leadership um, and allowed this to take place through providing supervision. Um, we'd like to, of course, acknowledge the medical student volunteers of Emory University School of Medicine, who were incredible in this effort. We appreciate your time and thank you. Good morning, uh, my name is Courtney Meyer. I'm a general surgery resident at Emory. I'm currently on a research sabbatical focusing um, my work in trauma surgery and public health. Today, I'm going to be discussing our work on patterns of adolescent firearm related injury or FRI. So as many of us know, FRI remains a public health crisis in the United States and recently became the leading cause of death among children and adolescents. And while this trend has been observed on a national scale, there remains less literature on how the patterns of demographics most at risk, injury patterns, and mortality rates vary in different regions of the country. And therefore, this study sought to investigate patterns of adolescent FRI right here in Atlanta, Georgia, and use this data to identify areas for targeted intervention. So in order to do this, um, we put together a citywide adolescent FRI database, which was generated through a collaboration of the major trauma centers serving the city. And then a retrospective cohort review was conducted from January 2016 through June of 2021 and included all patients between the ages of 11 and 21 to the definition of adolescent patients by the AAP or the Association of American Pediatrics. And so in addition to a descriptive um, and multivariate analysis, a time series analysis with dickey fuller testing and univariable linear regression was conducted. Um, so what did we find? During the study period, there were nearly 1,500 adolescent victims of FRI treated across the city of Atlanta. They had a median age of 18 years and were predominantly Black males. 
Over the five-year period, we saw a significant rise in the incidence of adolescent FRI, with 219 events occurring in 2016 and a greater than 60% increase to 364 events in 2020, and then data on track to surpass this with 196 events alone in the first half of 2021. And so while incidence rose, our mortality rate actually steadily decreased from a peak of 16.2% in 2017 to 9.3% in 2020. In terms of mechanisms of injury as shown in figure one, we saw that over 70% of injuries each year were intentional or due to some form of assault or interpersonal violence. We also noted a rise in the incidence of injuries secondary to unintentional firearm discharge, which made up 7.3% of injuries in 2016, and then nearly 14% of injuries in 2020. And this represented a rate of 7.6 additional unintentional injuries annually, um, and was statistically significant on Dickey Fuller regression testing, which essentially quantifies change over time compared to a rooted starting point. Um, and then a multivariate analysis, independent risk factors for mortality included age per additional year, um, a self-inflicted mechanism, and then having this event occur in the year 2020 compared to 2016 as a baseline. Um, so what can we take away from this study? Our data demonstrates that Atlanta, Georgia is no exception to the adolescent gun violence epidemic that we see nationally. Interestingly, um, while our incidence of events annually did increase, our decreasing mortality rate actually suggests improvement in our ability to care for these patients across the trauma centers of the city of Atlanta. And I think this is likely, unfortunately, due to just increased exposure and familiarity with caring for this patient population. Um, regardless, in the context of a really pivotal time for firearm policy reform in the United States, we can use data generated from studies like this to serve as critical evidence for informing targeted interventions and laws. For example, we noted an alarming increase in the rates of injuries secondary to unintentional discharge of firearms among adolescents, suggesting that perhaps efforts within the city of Atlanta should focus on safe storage practices within firearm owning households. Um, and we hope to continue this project in search of additional areas for targeted public health intervention. So in particular, next using injury zip codes to investigate the impact of geospatial location and levels of socioeconomic distress on outcomes for this patient population. Um, so stay tuned for some results for that uh, in the future. And with that, I appreciate your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, my name is Kasturi Nair, and I'm joined with my, by my colleagues, Megan Dahl and Anna Polminskis. We are first-year medical students at Emory University School of Medicine. We have created and are currently in the process of implementing our project titled Nutrition-Based Community Intervention for the Residents of Decatur, Georgia. Decatur, Georgia is a, rap is a highly diverse urban city located northeast of Atlanta that is rapidly growing. Our community partner, Decatur, Decatur Active Living, is a branch of the local government and serves as its Department of Parks and Recreation. With our community partner, we have identified healthy eating as an area that would benefit from intervention. Thus, we are creating a Decatur-focused calendar cookbook. Through working with Decatur Active Living and meeting with residents and community partner organizations, we learned that nutritional awareness and education was important to many members of the Decatur community. And so we decided to address that need through a calendar cookbook. In the calendar, each month with an affordable and nutritious recipe as well as a nutritional fact that pertains to a key ingredient in that recipe. For example, a recipe for chicken fajitas is accompanied by a nutritional fact about the high vitamin C content of bell peppers. Our hope is that by incorporating familiar and nutritious recipes into the calendar cookbook, we'll be able to engage with whole family units. To connect with the community, our calendar will feature a firefighter from the city of Decatur and a fun fact, such as their favorite way of staying active or favorite nutritious meal. Our calendar cookbook will be distributed around the Decatur community and handed out cooking demonstrations. These cooking demonstrations will be led by students and presented at community sites. Our results, summary, and conclusions are forthcoming, and we would like to give a special thanks to Decatur Active Living, specifically Jada Jordan and Gail Doyle, Gary Menard from the City of Decatur Fire and Rescue, and all of the CLSM faculty. Hello. My name is Kimmel Fungay, and I am presenting Simple Appreciation, Letters to Veterans. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, also known as the VA, serves the nation's veterans with lifelong health care. This includes acute care settings and community living centers. People living in these centers are usually older and at higher risk for getting sick. So visitors are often limited during outbreaks. 
As seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, strict lockdowns were enforced to protect the health of people in these age groups and communities. But veterans experienced depression due to the isolation from their loved ones. But COVID-19 didn't just affect the elderly. It also infected students who had to attend school virtually, missing out on the excitement and activities that come with being in person. So my co-authors and I came up with the idea to provide support to both of these communities. We thought the best way was to give students a chance to express themselves and serve their community through letters of appreciation to isolated veterans. To get this idea in motion, we partnered with the volunteer services at the VA to learn personalized information about the veterans who were in the community living centers. Next, we wanted to partner with our school and a few other schools in the area. We pitched our idea to our school administrators to recruit students who wanted to play a role in this project. These students would then receive information on their assigned veteran so that they could write their letters. Once we received the letters, we formatted them so they could be printed on high quality paper with a design that was produced in partnership to the Atlanta VA Media Department. The cards were then distributed to patients through the volunteer services since we were not allowed to be in the hospital or in the community living centers. Since August 2020 to March 2023, over 500 letters have been written and given to veterans in living centers and 58 students between 6th and 12th grade have participated in this project. We have received great feedback from veterans about the letters. This simple appreciation project gave isolated veterans support and encouragement while fostering a sense of purpose and agency among students. Thank you, and a special thanks to Dr. Cooper. Hello everyone, my name is Rosalind Bird. I'm current fourth year medical student at Emory University School of Medicine, as well as a uh, MPH student at Rollins School of Public Health. Um, and it's my pleasure today to share with you all our uh, project, This Is Your Moment, development of a novel, social, uh, novel media campaign to reduce HIV stigma in Black, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. So we know that in the United States, Black, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men have higher incidence and prevalence of HIV in addition to lower rates of engagement across the HIV continuum of care. The convergence of multiple stigmas related to HIV, homophobia, and racism occur at interpersonal, interpersonal, and organizational levels to create barriers to care that exacerbate inequities facing Black, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Currently, there exists no evidence-based interventions to address these intersectional stigmas or the impact that they have on engagement uh, in in the HIV consumer of care. So we, the time study team, uh, created this project with the purpose of developing time, a media campaign intervention for black, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men to decrease stigma and engage, uh, encourage engagement in HIV treatment and care services. Um, so to give you all a little bit of information about the actual intervention, um, it, Included an inter It consisted of an iterative process using intervention mapping with our community partners who are seven incredible, who include seven incredible um, young Black men part of Atlanta's uh, Black gay community. So the intervention design team met regularly with the study investigators to provide feedback on the content, as well as the aesthetics of the um, time videos. And so the resultant intervention content targets mind, body, and soul, HIV continuum of care outcomes representing body, mental health representing mind, and health-related quality of life representing soul. So we are uh, rely so um, the video content consists of several different segments, uh, one of which is called Kin, and it depicts realistic conversations targeting mental health, sexual stigma, and racism. Uh, we also have time, which time news, excuse me, that provides educational content about biomedical advances in HIV research. And then we also have game time, which incorporates educational content and de uh, debunks community myths and misconceptions around HIV and mental health service use. 
So um, as far as next steps, we uh, now that we have collaborated with our community leaders to create this intervention, we'll now be moving uh, to looking to understand the contextual determinants surrounding what future implementation of the Time Media campaign would look like. So we'll be conducting exploratory focus group discussions guided uh, by the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or CIFR, um, and we'll be purposefully selecting staff and providers representing different roles at uh, six different uh, community-based organizations and HIV clinics in Atlanta. So we will then conduct analysis, qualitative analysis of those focus group discussions uh, using a thematic approach to identify potential facilitators and barriers to implementation, um, and then through the process of refining and ultimately implementing the time media content, we know that we'll meet a critical need for programs addressing the intersectional stigmas that impact Black, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Through this work, we hope to create a care environment where Black, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men can achieve optimal physical and mental health outcomes.